Welcome to the second of three screencasts looking at media representation's agenda. Now in the first screencast on this topic, uh, we looked at some of the ways in which women have traditionally been represented in the mass media. And in this second screencast, we're going to look at a couple of things. Firstly, we're going to have a look at whether or not there have been any significant changes uh, in the way in which women are represented in the mass media. And we're also going to look at some theoretical explanations for gender stereotyping, uh, drawing upon the work of feminist sociologists. Now, within British society, over the last 20 to 30 years, there's been a fundamental change uh, in women's attitudes. And Wilkinson refers to this shift as a gender quake. And this means that the aspirations of women have dramatically changed with education and careers replacing marriage and the family as priorities for women. And some sociologists have argued that these social and cultural changes have started to affect the way in which women are represented in the mass media. For example, in his book Media, Gender and Identity, David Gauntlet argues that there is a growing social expectation that women and men should be treated equally and that this is increasingly reflected in media representations. So there is now more emphasis on independence and sexual freedom for women and there's a growing diversity uh, of imagery and role models for women uh, within the media. So we've seen a massive decrease since the 1970s in the proportion of women uh, whose main occupation was represented uh, as a housewife or mother. And one area in which representations of women have changed considerably, according to David Gauntlet, is in the genre of action in films and on television, in which women have been recast as the action hero or heroine. And maybe a turning point here um, was the release of Ridley Scott's movie Alien uh, in 1979. Uh, prior to the release of this film, most female roles in action films were largely secondary and passive and not usually directly involved uh, with the main thrust of the narrative. However, in Alien, this character, uh, called Ripley, uh, outlived her male colleagues as her spacecraft was attacked uh, by the hostile alien. Uh, she killed the intruder and survived, and therefore this film uh, invited the audience to reconsider uh, the role of women in action films. So Alien subverted hegemonic definitions of femininity by having a female lead character who was more confident and more powerful uh, than the male characters. And later examples of this female uh, action hero archetype are found in films such as G.I. Jane, Terminator 2 and the Lara Croft Tomb Raider franchise. So these women are represented as being fierce, tough and resourceful. However, as Knight points out, the characters in these films remain traditionally attractive and therefore still conform uh, to the male gaze and the beauty myth. In other words, these characters are still uh, objectified uh, and exist for uh, the pleasure of the male viewer. Changes in gender representations are also very evident uh, in magazines targeted at young women. So as we can see here, that in the past these magazines promoted a traditional idea of femininity, uh, what we referred to in the last screencast as the cult of femininity, where the dominant assumption was that girls should aspire to be beautiful uh, in order to get a husband, and once married they should become uh, homemakers and carers. By contrast, the focus of magazines since the 1980s, and Cosmopolitan was the magazine uh, that really broke the mould, uh, is on young women seeking to control their own lives rather than being dependent on men. So there's now much more emphasis on sexuality and less emphasis on romance. And according to McRobbie, 
the traditional idea of femininity is challenged, with women no longer portrayed uh, as the weaker sex. Instead, uh, young women are encouraged through these magazines to be more assertive, confident and supportive of each other. One traditional stereotype of women that hasn't really changed in recent years is the persistence of what Naomi Wolf calls the beauty myth. So this is the idea that women are assessed uh, primarily in terms of their appearance and expected to conform to male conceptions of female beauty. In fact, Tebble argues that things have got worse. Tebble suggests that at no other time in history have women been so preoccupied uh, with the shape that they're in uh, and their appearance. So just take a minute to watch this short video and jot down your ideas as to why uh, this kind of pressure to conform to the beauty myth uh, may be worse for your generation of young females than any other generation that has gone before you. So through the techniques that we saw uh, in that video, we could argue that the bodies and faces of real women have in effect been rendered invisible. They've been symbolically annihilated in the mass media and replaced by an idealised, youth-obsessed beauty cult with airbrushed images uh, of female beauty. And according to Kilbourne, this media representation presents women um, not as human beings, but as mannequins, as tall and thin, often size zero, with very long legs, perfect teeth and hair, and skin without a blemish in sight. And Susie Allback argues that these types of images uh, create anxieties in young females with regard to their body image and identity. So she notes that the media... Uh, especially those magazines that focus on fashion and celebrity, perpetuate the idea that slimness equals success, health, happiness and popularity. And she accuses the media of overemphasising this aspect of the beauty ideal and for encouraging young girls to be unhappy with their bodies. So I think it's easy to find evidence for this beauty myth right across the media spectrum and women, much more than men, uh, are often expected to be young and attractive, uh, whether as actors, presenters, uh, or in other roles within the media. Okay, I want to end this screencast by briefly looking at how we might interpret uh, stereotypes of women within the media uh, using some theory. And we're going to look at feminism, and as you probably remember from the work that we did on sociological theory at the beginning of the course, there isn't one version of feminism. Feminism is made up of a variety of different perspectives and we're going to look at uh, three of the most important feminist perspectives. Firstly, liberal feminists would argue that the negative stereotypes of women uh, within the mass media are primarily a product of the underrepresentation of women uh, within the media industry. So women are underrepresented as 
chief executives, senior managers, editors and journalists. So media organisations uh, still tend to be male-dominated, which encourages them to adopt a male view of the world. So this will change according to the liberal feminist perspective uh, if women uh, gain more power and equal opportunities in media organisations, uh, enabling them to break through the glass ceiling. In other words, from this perspective, the symbolic annihilation of women uh, in media representations will only really begin to change uh, when more women uh, are given opportunities to work uh, in senior positions within the media industry. Marxist feminism looks at the way in which certain stereotypes of women are presented in the media because of their benefits for capitalism and the profits of private businesses. So in relation to the beauty myth, they would argue that the cosmetics, fashion, uh, diet and cosmetic surgery industries all promote the beauty myth because they profit from it. So from this perspective, the beauty myth is a form of false consciousness. It's about uh, making women uh, think about themselves and think about femininity in a very false and distorted way. And they would link this to the need of private businesses to provide us with false needs, to sell us uh, products and services that we don't really need. In other words, the beauty myth is predicated on the idea that happiness must come from consumerism, from buying consumer products and services such as clothes, makeup, hair products, gym memberships and so on. For radical feminists, the key concept is patriarchy. And patriarchy, remember, uh, refers to the way in which society uh, is dominated by men. So they would argue that the media world like the world in general, is a man's world which seeks to keep women uh, in a narrow range of stereotype roles where they can continue to be subordinate to men. So where they conform to the beauty myth uh, and look good, it's all about conforming to men's expectations of women. So they would argue that male-generated stereotypes of femininity discourage women from making the most of the opportunities available to them and undermine any threat to male dominance in society. So for radical feminists, the media is an ideological institution that promotes patriarchy. And one area of particular concern to radical feminists is the commercial and sexual exploitation of women's bodies within the media. And in class, we have a look at the campaign that connects these images, the No More Page Free uh, campaign. 